The Ammons Haunting Case is one of the most terrifying documented cases of demonic possession of the 21st century. This case is backed not only by legitimate DCS documents, but also by official police records, all of which claim that something truly evil was occurring at this house in Indiana. The story was publicized in January of 2014 when the house became infamously known as the 200 Demons House, or simply the Demon House, because it was said to be haunted by at least 200 spirits. Hey everyone, Ordinary Horror Guy here and this is the terrifying true story of the haunting of Latoya Ammons. Latoya Ammons was a mother of three who moved to a suburban home in Gary, Indiana with her mother, Rosa Campbell, in November of 2011. They rented a house located at 3860 Carolina Street, set in a very quiet neighborhood lined with mostly one-story houses. The house consisted of three bedrooms, one bathroom, a living room, and a basement that led up to a small kitchen. It was a relatively standard house and perfect for the size of their family. The three children, then aged 7, 9, and 12, are largely unknown but play an extremely important role in the story. For the sake of the video, we'll refer to them as Connor, Jacob, and Alyssa. During the first month, the house was relatively normal. The family was just getting settled in and nothing unusual really stood out until later that December. One day, huge black flies randomly started swarming the screened porch at the front of their house. The family was completely dumbfounded as to why this was happening and thought, is there something rotting around here that's causing all these flies? However, there wasn't anything rotting, so their only solution was to just try and swat all of them. But as they kept killing swarm after swarm of flies, they just kept coming back back. At some point, they gave up and just waited for the flies to go away, which they eventually did. Although this experience was far from normal, they just chalked it up to a strange occurrence, and at this point, they were more annoyed than scared. However, things began to change as the days progressed. Several times well after midnight, Latoya and her mother both recall hearing heavy footsteps coming up the basement stairs and even creaking open the door that led into the kitchen. But when they went to check who was there, they didn't find anybody. Just an empty door leading into a dark basement. They eventually tried locking the door to see if it would prevent the noise, but it continued regardless. This is when Latoya and her mother really started to get creeped out. Their fear intensified when one night Latoya's mom Rosa was sleeping in her bedroom and suddenly awoke to see a shadowy figure of a man pacing back and forth across the living room. As she stared out of her door down the hallway, she couldn't believe her eyes. She eventually dashed out of bed, turned on all of the lights, and what she saw terrified her. In the living room, right where the shadowy figure had been pacing, were these big wet boot prints all across the wooden floor. These puzzling experiences only increased in the months to come. By March 10th, 2012, after nearly four months of these odd occurrences, something would happen that would shift this story from just creepy to absolutely horrifying. A few days prior, one of Latoya's loved ones had passed away. Latoya had been mourning with her family and a group of friends in the house at around 2 o'clock in the morning. At some point during the night, Latoya started screaming for her mother to come to her room. As Rosa rushed down the hall to enter her bedroom, she saw something truly unexplainable. Latoya's 12-year-old daughter Alyssa was completely unconscious and levitating directly above Rosa's bed. In a state of shock, the only thing Rosa and Latoya could think of doing was to pray around the bed and hope she would snap out of it. After a while, she slowly descends onto the bed and wakes up with no recollection of what just happened. At this point, the family is completely convinced that something paranormal is taking place in their house. Being of Christian faith, they first look to local churches for help. They began asking around for advice, but most of the churches refused to do anything. Only one complied and visited the house to investigate, and unsurprisingly, they came to the same conclusion. Something strange was definitely happening in this house. Latoya and her mother followed every piece of advice the church offered. They cleaned the entire house with bleach and ammonia, used olive oil to draw crosses on all the doors and windows, and even anointed the children's hands and feet with the oil as well. The use of oil might seem strange outside of a religious perspective, but in Christianity, anointing oil is seen as symbolic of God's protection. So naturally, the Ammons family saw this as the best option to combat the evil spirits. They also reached out to a couple of clairvoyants for some insight. After investigating the house, these clairvoyants believed that there were over 200 evil spirits haunting it. 
leading to the house being dubbed the 200 Demons House. They were urged to move out immediately, but at the time, Latoya didn't have the money to move anywhere else. As an alternate effort, they set up a shrine in the basement with a statue of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, where they lit candles and read from Psalm 91 of the Bible as a form of ritual to try and rid themselves of the evil spirits. For the next three days, nothing happened and things seemed completely normal. However, that didn't last for long. After these three days, things took a very bad turn and real demonic possessions started to occur, not only possessing Latoya, but also her three children. She reported feeling warm, lightheaded sensations whenever spirits started attacking her, almost like an acute fever. She would lose control of her body and just start trembling as the demons attempted to take over. Periodically, she also witnessed terrifying instances with her children. At times, seemingly out of nowhere, they would develop these huge bulging eyes and evil smiles, while talking in low growling whispers. As if the possessions weren't enough, the spirits became much more physical and intrusive in the coming weeks. One day, the family recalls Connor being thrown out of the bathroom as if someone had just chucked him as hard as they could. Alyssa also remembers being randomly hit in the head with a flying headboard, and at times feeling as if someone was grabbing her by the neck and attempting to suffocate her. Demonic voices also told the children disturbing things, such as how it feels to die and that they would die soon and never see their family again. By April 19th, 2012, the family was so desperate for help that they reached out to their physician, Dr. Jeffrey Onyekwu. Latoya told him every little detail of what had been happening, and he eventually agreed to visit their house to witness these strange occurrences himself. And sure enough, he witnessed it. During Onyeku's visit, both Connor and Jacob started screaming and cursing at him in demonic voices, before being chucked backward extremely hard into a wall. The police were called and the children were taken to the Methodist Hospital campus. Onyeku stated that he hadn't experienced something this horrifying in his complete 20 years as a physician. At the hospital, Connor didn't calm down. He remained in an entranced demonic state, convulsing and screaming, requiring multiple doctors to hold him down. The commotion prompted an anonymous call to the Department of child safety, reporting Latoya for possible child abuse. A DCS case manager named Valerie Washington arrived at the hospital to inspect the children and conduct an interview. However, after careful examination, they determined that there wasn't any marks or bruises on the children that appeared to be from physical beatings. And after talking to Latoya, they concluded that she wasn't mentally unstable, making it unlikely she had been abusing the children. Valerie then attempted to interview Connor and Jacob twice, but each time they started acting crazy talking in demonic voices again. At one point, Jacob even glided backward across the floor, hovered up the wall, and flipped in midair flawlessly, landing on his feet. These occurrences were documented in legitimate DCS reports, making it nearly impossible for this to not have happened. Both Valerie and a hospital nurse who had witnessed this recalled running out of the room in pure terror. At this point, three trustworthy bystanders confirmed, without a doubt, that what the Ammons were experiencing was something supernatural. That night, Latoya looked after Connor in the hospital, while Rosa took Jacob and Alyssa to stay at a relative's house. Coincidentally, it was Connor's birthday the very next day, so to take the children's minds off the stressful situation, they celebrated at the hospital singing and eating cake together. However, bad news struck soon after. Valerie returned to the hospital and informed Latoya and her mother that the children would need to be taken into temporary protective custody without a court order. She claimed the kids were suffering from quote, spiritual and emotional distress. The kids were terrified and Latoya couldn't even take them home to care for them. On the same day, a chaplain at the hospital called a man named Michael Maginot. He was a reverend at a local church and was asked to perform an exorcism on Jacob as soon as possible. However, he was a bit skeptical about whether the Ammons were experiencing true demonic activity, so they invited him to their house to experience it himself. He conducted a four hour long interview with both Latoya and her mother, and sure enough, strange things began to happen. Lights flickered, blinds in the kitchen wafted in the air, and he even saw the same wet footprints in the living room that Rosa had experienced months earlier. During the interview, Latoya started feeling that same warm, lightheaded sensation before her possessions occurred, so in an attempt to help her, Michael placed his crucifix on her forehead. She started violently convulsing and thrashing around. By the time she had calmed down, Michael was entirely convinced that there was demonic activity in the house. He even stated that he believed the spirits were threatened by his presence. He quickly blessed the home and urged Latoya and her mother to stay with other relatives, which they did. 
A week later, they cooperated in an investigation of the house conducted by their DCS case manager, Valerie, and officers from local police departments. Among these officers was the chief of the Gary Police Department, 37-year-old Charles Austin. He said he believed in the paranormal, but really didn't subscribe to the existence of demons. However, this investigation would quickly change his mind. Latoya didn't enter the house out of fear, but her mother went inside to help the officers navigate. She pointed out a notorious spot in the house for activity, the space underneath the basement stairs. She told the officers that the activity often manifested in the form of ghostly orbs. In other parts of the house, the officers also began noticing strange occurrences. One of the audio recorders an officer carried showed that the battery was almost dead, even though he had replaced it that same day. They also claimed to have heard a faint whisper when listening back to another recorder, which simply said, hey. Photos were taken around the house, and one specifically taken under the stairs appeared to show two figures when the police enhanced the image. Although the enhanced images weren't provided, so I took the liberty of adjusting it myself to see what I could find. I'm no expert at this, but when adjusting the curves of the image, you can kind of see a black figure under the stairs. And when it's zoomed in and adjusted even more, you can kind of make out another face directly to the left of it. Does this mean there's proof of demons? Not at all, but again, I don't know exactly what they did to the image, but they seemed pretty convinced that something was definitely there. Additionally, a photo was taken outside of the house when no one was home, showing a ghostly white figure standing to the right of the front porch. After the officers finished their investigation, they were undoubtedly spooked, especially Chief Charles Austin. He claimed that as he was driving home for the day, his police radio started malfunctioning, and his driver's seat kept drifting back and forth, even though it had been working perfectly fine on the drive to the Ammons house. When he got home, his garage door refused to open, even though the power was working fine everywhere else. Later that month, the DCS obtained an official court order for the temporary custody of Latoya's three children after it was discovered that they had missed numerous days of school over the course of three years. While Latoya took responsibility for the subsequent years, she explained that she had allowed them to skip school due to the terror and exhaustion from sleepless nights dealing with the spirits in their house. Regardless, Jacob and Alyssa were sent to St. Joseph's Carmelite Home in Chicago, while Connor was sent to Christian Haven in Wheatfield, Indiana for a psychiatric examination. Clinical psychologist Stacy Wright conducted the examination on Connor. She observed that Connor behaved normally when asked everyday questions, but would suddenly act possessed, as she put it, when faced with intense, challenging questions related to the demonic activity. His stories also became convoluted and inconsistent, changing each time he recounted them. Further tests concluded that Connor had no psychotic disorders. Stacy even blamed Latoya, suggesting that she might have been neglecting her children and fabricating the entire story. Similarly, Jacob and Alyssa were evaluated by another clinical psychologist named Joel Schwartz. As they described the strange occurrences they had experienced, doors slamming, items moving randomly, and the family falling into trances, Schwartz came to the same conclusion. He believed Latoya was unstable and fabricating the entire situation despite her having been evaluated and deemed sane. However, this is a common reaction from people who haven't experienced the paranormal firsthand. They often point fingers and place blame without knowing the entire story. Unfortunately, this was challenging for Latoya because she knew she wasn't making anything up and had strong alibis in her defense. Yet, this wasn't enough to regain custody of her children. On May 10th, 2012, there was a significant search of the Ammons residence for any strange phenomena that could further build a case. Latoya, her mother, Charles Austin, the Reverend, a couple of other officers, and a new DCS case manager named Samantha Illich attended the search. Their previous manager, Valerie, had stated that she never wanted to go back to the house. Their primary focus was the basement where they claimed to have seen the two figures under the stairs. In that same spot, there was a patch of dirt, and Reverend Michael asked the officers to dig a hole to search for potentially cursed items. They dug a four foot by three foot hole in the ground and discovered various random items, ranging from white underwear to a small frying pan. Although these were unlikely to be cursed, Michael blessed them with salt just in case. After an extensive search, they found nothing of interest in the house, and people began to feel uneasy and wanted to leave immediately. The only ones who remained were two officers and Reverend Michael. During their part of the investigation, they noticed a strange oil dripping from the Venetian blinds in one of the bedrooms, and no matter how much they wiped it away, it just kept reappearing. As the officers stood puzzled, Michael explained that this was a common manifestation in the presence of a demonic entity. At this point, nobody was taking things lightly. Something needed to be done right away. 
Soon after, Michael sent a document detailing all the strange occurrences to a local bishop to name Dale Melzik. He requested permission to perform an exorcism based on their experiences. Initially, the bishop denied his request, leading him to conduct a less powerful exorcism that didn't require church authority. A few days later, Latoya, Michael, Stephanie, and two officers gathered at the Ammons residence for the exorcism. Michael read from the Bible, said prayers, and attempted to verbally cast out the demons that attached themselves to Latoya. Everyone recalled feeling very uncomfortable during this process, almost as if they were being intensely watched. However, after the exorcism, Michael was unsatisfied with the results, believing it had done little help. He then asked Latoya to research any specific demons that she believed might be responsible for all this. He claimed that knowing a demon's name would grant more authority over it. After extensive searching, Latoya believed she had found some promising results. However, Michael was quite concerned. One of the main demons that she believed was tormenting her was named Beelzebub, also known as Lord of the Flies in English translation. Beelzebub was a horrifying and infamous spirit in demonology. It was known to have a fly-like appearance but could also shapeshift into various monstrous forms. Known as one of the seven princes of hell, it was considered very powerful and capable of possessing multiple people. If you recall, in the beginning of these strange events, flies swarmed Latoya's front porch, adding to the fact that this just might be one of her demons. Although terrifying, this was one of the few explanations that made sense. Fortunately, Bishop Melzik finally gave Michael permission to perform an exorcism on Latoya with church backing. This was a pretty significant development because church-approved exorcisms are believed to be more powerful. Michael conducted three separate exorcisms on Latoya at the local Maryville church. Two were conducted in English and one in Latin. During these exorcisms, he praised God and commanded the evil spirits to leave Latoya Ammons and her house as he pressed a crucifix against her head. Throughout the process, she convulsed violently more than she ever had before, revealing the immense power these spirits held over her. Latoya compared the feeling to intense childbirth, as if something was striving to remain inside her and cause as much pain as possible. However, over the course of the month, the spirits slowly began to leave Latoya and her family alone. By the third exorcism, their problems finally subsided. It was the last time she ever saw Michael Maginot, but she was eternally grateful. There were finally no more disturbances, and in November of 2012, Latoya eventually regained custody of her children. They moved to Indianapolis and haven't experienced any paranormal normal activity since. The house at 3860 Carolina Street hasn't shown any signs of activity either. However, in 2014 when the Ammon story was made public, it became a global spectacle. People were deeply interested in the events that transpired. Latoya and her mother were featured on multiple news stories recounting their experiences, and paranormal investigator Zach Baggins eventually purchased the house that same year. It was used to film a documentary based on the haunting events called Demon House. Unfortunately, the entire building was demolished just two years later. Latoya Toya and her family went through a harrowing experience over the course of an entire year dealing with what appears to be a true demonic possession. However, they are undoubtedly relieved that the nightmare is finally over. But that's going to be it for today, I hope you guys did enjoy. As you already may have noticed, this is a new channel that will be uploading weekly videos covering a range of disturbing topics, from urban legends to true crime and even true horror stories. So if you enjoyed today's video, stay tuned for more content just like this. We also have a subreddit dedicated to the Ordinary Horror Guy channel, where you can help me out and post video suggestions for cases that interest you. Additionally, we also have an email where you can submit your own personal horror stories if you'd like them to be featured in a video. Video. You can find all the relevant links in the description if you'd like to check them out. Thank you guys, I'll see you soon in the next video.